Her eight symphonies are by far the most of any female composer of her time, and of all things, she can lay some claim to modern triangle writing. I'm the classical nerd, and today we're talking about Emily Mayer. Emily Mayer was born in 1812 and was the daughter of an apothecary who encouraged his daughter's musical talent. Her life was beset with early difficulty, as her mother died when she was quite young and she herself fell into some kind of eating disorder. Though she got lessons on the piano and on the organ, her main function was just helping around the house with her mother out of the picture. It was her father's suicide in 1840 that really caused her to throw herself into her work. She moved to the nearest big city and began composition lessons with Carl Lowe, absolutely burying herself in her work. Lowe was flabbergasted by her idiosyncratic musicality, saying that paradoxically, she both knew everything and nothing at all. Her compositional studies continued throughout the decade, and she produced a steady stream of works throughout. By the end of the decade, her pieces were in print, and in 1850, after a concert devoted exclusively to her music, her career absolutely took off. By then, she was in Berlin, one of Germany's many musical capitals, and continued producing works to wide acclaim. While early in her career, she had to contend with a great many statements from critics attempting to qualify her music on the basis of her gender, by the 1850s she was known as one of the elite musical talents. Mayer died rather suddenly in 1883, just before her 71st birthday. Her body of work is remarkably well-rounded, and includes an opera, the aforementioned eight symphonies, seven string quartets, twelve cello sonatas, and nine violin sonatas, of which seven now remain. The symphonies are clustered earlier in her career, with the chamber music coming later. She brought the triangle to the level of orchestral soloist in her sixth symphony, written in the same year as Franz Liszt's first piano concerto, a piece that's often given sole credit for pioneering this particular orchestral innovation. But they should really both be given credit because they were written around the same time. Generally, her pieces are steeped in a romanticism that looked specifically back towards the classical era for its inspiration, much as Mendelssohn and later Brahms did. After her death, her work fell into obscurity, and it's only recently that scholars have been digging through and uncovering what is truly an extraordinarily vast legacy. Mm -hmm. 